And with this, we want to invite uh, the next speaker. And that's uh, Rosalind uh, or Ross Rickaby, uh, who is professor and chair of geology at Oxford University. And uh, she has been uh, instrumental in combining um, biology and chemistry to resolve questions concerning climate through the deep geological record, but also evolution. And um, uh, always with phytoplankton uh, in the focus. And uh, I want to add that she was also the first to notice that I was wearing my cockleid suit today <laughs> to honor the day. Uh, please, um, Ross, take the floor. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that fantastic introduction and, and what an opportunity to be here and hear these fantastic uh, talks. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a delight to be here to honour and celebrate with Andy Knoll. I was lucky enough to be in Harvard for a short time uh, with Andy, sadly not in his group. I was a geochemist peering over the wall. But it's clear that osmotrophy works and many of those ideas permeated through into the geochemistry and I have to say I continue to be inspired by, by Andy's work and find myself always, oh goodness me, Andy Knowles on this paper as well. Um, so the, the question, I guess I'm going to try and put a bit of a chemical spin. We've heard a lot about fossils, we've heard a lot about evolution, and I'm going to try and put, I guess, a bit of a biological and, and chemical spin on, on how I at least think of some opportunities of evolution. And I guess I'm going to put it in the context of the transformation of the atmosphere. We, of course, all know that the, the early atmosphere was suffocating with primarily reducing species in the atmosphere, lots of methane, nitrogen, and CO2 was heavily abundant in those early atmospheres. And over Earth's history, it's transformed to be this oxidized atmosphere that, of course, allows for aerobic life to flourish. Um, but at the same time, carbon dioxide has diminished to become, at least for the moment, a trace component uh, of the atmosphere. And we're all curious, we're all wondering, when does oxygen go up? When does carbon dioxide go down? How does this evolve? alongside this fascinating history of phytoplankton, which Andy has already um, given much of the context to. And I just wanted to reintroduce uh, the groups. These, of course, are the phytoplankton, which are driving oxygen production rates, at least from the ocean, producing half of, of the oxygen in today's atmosphere, and contributing to that organic carbon burial, which is driving partly the drawdown in CO2 alongside weathering. And we, we've heard a lot about this building of the, the eukaryotic cell and indeed the, the phototrophic eukaryotic cell. And for some parts of this talk, I'm going to also focus on other groups of algae. And we've heard about these, but I just want to re-emphasize that they derive those after the um, endocytosis of the cyanobacteria to make the photosynthetic eukaryote. There is divergence and we have these primary endosymbionts where there's only been one uh, symbiotic event leading to the green algae, which of course then become the ancestors of the land plants. Through that diversification, we have a second primary endosymbiont, the rhodophyte. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to term this the red algae compared to the, the green algae. And I'm going to try and define, when I'm talking about primary endosymbionts, this single take-in of a cyanobacterial cell. But there is further Russian dolls in the, in the life of, 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 of our planet, where we have these secondary endosymbiotic events, where this, this primary endosymbiont is taken in by another heterotroph, uh, such that we, we have this double um, endosymbiotic event. And that leads to the, hetero, uh, the heterocontophytes, the haptophytes, or we often think of these, as, or at least I do, as the diatoms, uh, the coccolithophores. So just to give you that context of the endosymbiotic history and the different lineages that Andy has already highlighted dominate the ocean, we think at different times, although clearly these boundaries are open to uh, debate. <coughs> 
And my initial interest, I guess I became fascinated by phytoplankton, firstly because of the fossils they leave behind, but also because they're photosynthetic and at the heart of their metabolism is this enzyme Rubisco. And this is in all photosynthetic life, but it has this challenge. It's, it hasn't necessarily catalyzed its own downfall, but it's very good at fixing carbon to create sugars, which then drive energy through the cell. But it's poor at discriminating between carbon dioxide and oxygen. And if it, if it binds with oxygen, it undergoes photorespiration. And this is an energetic loss to the cell. And I became fascinated by this enzyme because it is at the heart of wanting to know about atmospheric evolution. It is responding to carbon dioxide and oxygen in the environment. And those are the two gases. We think of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas and oxygen as being key for metabolism. And I thought, well, there must be some kind of history of our atmosphere somehow incorporated into Rubisco. Can I try and become a, something more of a biologist to understand its evolution? And this involves firstly looking into genes, as I'll show you in a second, but also characterizing some more of its biochemistry, its efficiency, its ability to discriminate between carbon dioxide and oxygen. And as I'll show you, different algal groups have different specificities, discriminating effects between CO2 and oxygen. And this then dictates when they're exposed to CO2 and oxygen at that intracellular environment of Rubisco, the relative rate of carbon fixation relative to photorespiration. So I started to look into genes and I was fortunate to work with Dmitry Filatov in Oxford to, to try and look at this adaptive evolution of Rubisco. So this was the first idea of can we see time of change in Rubisco which may reflect periods of change in the carbon dioxide and oxygen ratio in the environment. And to do that we used this DN by DS method. This is very simply looking at the rate of mutation in codons where a mutation can lead to a change in the protein, a non-synonymous change, and this is because uh, uh, you get changes in these, in these codon sequences that sometimes lead to change, but are sometimes silent to the, to the um, amino acid uh, sequence of the protein. So here's a silent mutation. Uh, we change a, a G to a C, and that leads to no change in the protein. Whereas here, we've got a, a mutation, a C to an A, and that means we have a change in the amino acid sequence of the protein, and therefore a change in the function of the protein. And we can use looking at the rates of these mutations to actually find times where selective change has occurred, where a change has happened and it's been selected and propagated through the tree. And if we look at this in, in amongst uh, the algae, this is looking, so this is a horrible tree to look at, and I, I don't expect you to read any of this, but in the lower part of the branches, we're looking at the rhodophytes uh, going up into the diatoms and, and the coccolithophores towards the top of, of this tree. And what was interesting was that we got this clustering, these red branches here are where we've got positive selection being experienced along that branch of, of genetic change and positive selection propagating to a, a new feature of the Rubisco protein. This is looking in the large uh, uh, subunit of the Rubisco protein. And these were all clustered around about the date of about 1.1 billion years. We can argue about this in terms of the molecular clock, but what's clear is that it's at the branch really between this primary endosymbiont, the, the, the rhodophytes, going into the secondary endosymbionts. And what's absolutely clear along that transition is that as that primary endosymbiont has, has gone in, or sorry, this is the primary endosymbiont taking in the, se the secondary endosymbiont, is that we're increasing the number of members membranes from two to four around this chloroplast. And membranes allow carbon dioxide to diffuse across it, but they are selective. They, they, they slow down the diffusion of this. So it's, we, the hypothesis is that by placing Rubisco, taking it into the cell and then surrounding it by a number of membranes leads to a change in the intracellular environment around that Rubisco. So we wanted to try and explore what does that mean for the biochemistry of the Rubisco. And 
we, I kind of hoped that I would find Rubisco getting better in its selection through geological time. But in this branch of algae, what's actually happening is its selectivity for carbon dioxide relative to oxygen is actually declining. As we go from this primary endosymbiont here, it's got a highly selective Rubisco. And as we go through this endosymbiotic event uh, in the blue here, we're seeing the decrease in the specificity of that Rubisco. And what we're also looking here at the KC, this is the affinity of the Rubisco for that CO2 substrate, where a higher concentration here tells me I need more carbon for that Rubisco to, to, to function. It's got a, a lower affinity for CO2. So we could interpret this actually in terms of an increasing inter intracellular CO2 environment, perhaps in response to this secondary endosymbiotic event, which is essentially allowing uh, the organism to capture carbon dioxide around the rubisco and allow that rubisco to relax. And that's probably what we're seeing. It's relaxing its specificity in this change in, in positive selection. It may be that that is in response to the environment becoming more hostile for a highly specific uh, uh, rubisco, that the rubisco has to find a more intracellular, higher CO2, lower oxygen environment for its function. But it's clear that that process allows it to uh, relax. I was curious to see if I could see any other events of this adaptive uh, selection. And this is looking now more, more closely amongst the haptophytes. This is the tree that contains the, the coccolithophores. And what's interesting is the very, a very similar story uh, uh, emerges looking here. We have a couple of events as we go across this branch between the pavlovales and, and the, the primnesiales. We have a couple of events of positive selection, and particularly across this ancient uh, branch here that uh, I guess our, our clock puts it at about 400 uh, million years or so. Interestingly, at the time of the land plants uh, 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 going or, or starting to terrestrialize uh, uh, the land. But again, we see that the same sort of correlation, perhaps, of, of a changing intracellular environment for that rubisco, where here I'm, I'm pointing out these lineages have all got this thing called a pyranoid. Now, pyranoid is really captured nicely on this nanosims image of, of a coccolithophore. And it's this highly dense rubisco intensive part of the chloroplast, where they're essentially bunching the rubisco together and arguably have a carbonic anhydrase in the middle, which is allowing bicarbonate to turn to CO2 and diffuse out through this pyranoid. So this is part of a carbon concentrating mechanism, we think. And all of the species down here have got an immersed pyranoid in part of their, their chloroplast. They're also, uh, we, we can find uh, certain carbonic anhydrases we believe associated with carbon concentrating. Whereas the pavlovales have basically got no pyranoid. Their rubisco is distributed entirely throughout uh, uh, the, the chloroplast. And we can't find the evidence of, of the carbonic anhydrase. So again, we're seeing selection for a carbon concentrating mechanism, which is increasing the CO2 to O2 ratio inside the cell, perhaps to help rubisco function in a more oxidized environment. But it's allowing that rubisco to relax. So if we now look at a whole range of rubisco selectivities or specificities, which I'm putting up here. So here we've got the rhodophytes up at the top almost of this, this, this um, algal tree. The purples are picking out the, the, the diatoms. The blues are the haptophytes that we've just looked at in that selective tree. And down here in the green squares, we've got the green algae. And in the green dots, we've got the, the cyanobacteria. And what's really interesting to me is that there's almost a sort of scale of specificity to the rubiscos in these different algal groups, where the rhodophytes seem to be well adapted to high oxygen to CO2 levels. And that oxygen to CO2 level seems to decline as we come back here to the cyanobacteria. Now, we can interpret that perhaps to tell us something about the environments that are selecting for these species. But we can also interpret that perhaps as the way the species are created creating intracellular environments for the rubisco, such that that rubisco is adapted to low O2 to CO2 environments up here and high O2 to CO2 uh, environments here. And what's interesting is that this seems to correlate with, the, with the, the sorts of metabolisms that these organisms are adapted to. So we know cyanobacteria can be facultative anaerobes and live aerobically, and the same is true for the green algae. 
Meanwhile, the diatoms, the coccolithophores, really require obligate uh, aerobicity. And the rhodophytes seem to really be well adapted to hyperoxic uh, uh, circumstances. And it's certainly clear that in the fossil record, they're always found in these supratidal uh, environments. So it's almost like Rubisco is telling us about this um, intracellular and ecological environment of adaptation. And it's possible that things like the cyanobacteria are having to put a lot of energy into transporting or to either excluding oxygen and transporting CO2 to the site of Rubisco, which allows it to persist almost in this ancient environment within the cell. And this is just to reaffirm this correlation with the different metabolic pathways that if we peer into the genomes and look for evidence of different um, genes associated with different an uh, anaerobic metabolic pathways, the rhodophytes that we have have got absolutely no met anaerobic metabolic pathways whatsoever. And again, this correlates with a sort of high O2 to CO2 adaptation. The haptophytes and the diatoms have got a little smattering, which we think of as being uh, acquired via lateral gene flow, whereas the chlorophytes are absolutely jam-packed with anaerobic metabolic pathways. So it's almost like there's an oxic gradient to these, um, these algae, and I kind of uh, was, was pleased to think about it in geological terms, where we think of red beds always indicating oxidized environments and green always indicating reduced environments. And it would seem that in a sort of anecdotal way that the, the green algae and the red algae are, are mimicking those, those geological colors. This was just a, a really nice piece of, of work. To, there's been, in some fields, desperate measures to try and improve rubisco specificity. This is at the heart of, of crops and our ability to grow crops. Kind of, can we get a better ability to, to fix carbon? And uh, I was curious, now that we have this expanded data set of rubisco um, biochemistry, can we actually understand biochemically what's driving this, this change in the enzyme? And so I was lucky enough to work with Saroj Prudel, part of Paul uh, Falkowski's lab, where rather than just looking at amino acids around the active site, we started to expand the view to see which is folding around that active site and going beyond the active site of Rubisco. And what's rather interesting, these are Rubisco uh, crystal forms of different selectivity, so a, a incredibly low selectivity going to incredibly high selectivity. And we, what we were able to chart out was this increasing density of positive charge as we go to higher selective uh, rubiscos. Now, these channels of positive charge are actually able to discriminate between carbon dioxide and oxygen because of the changing electronegativity of the carbons relative to the oxygen, which pull those electrons to themselves and create slight negative charges at either end of the CO2, whereas the oxygen is entirely neutral. And that means that this CO2 can be attracted into these positively charged pockets and almost have an in-house in -house enzyme carbon concentrating mechanism, which helps that uh, uh, Rubisco have a forwards reaction. Now, just thinking about what's creating these positive channels and the, the amino acids that are able to contribute a positive charge to an enzyme are these ones up here. So we've got arginine, histidine, and lysine. And what's interesting about those amino acids is just in terms of the cost to the cell of having a highly specific enzyme, is that they've got, they're have got they very nitrogen dense compared to all the other amino acids. They've got multiple nitrogens as part of those uh, uh, molecules. And that means that this, these highly specific rubiscos don't come at no cost to the cell. They have to have sufficient nitrogen to be able to generate those rubiscos. And we know that some organisms express more rubisco when they're being more challenged by the environment. I now want to, to just bring in this concept that perhaps I've, I've talked about an oxic scale to the algae, but I think that actually pH may well be contributing alongside oxygen. And this is starting to resonate some of the ideas of Andy, this correlation of phytoplankton in space and time. And, and I guess what I'm trying to unpick are the factors that are controlling those correlations of phytoplankton in space and time. And I'm arguing that I think that oxic oxidizing potential of the environment is one of those selecting factors. But pH is also potentially a component of that. And of course, that's going to control very much the CO2 concentration, where at low uh, pH, I've got higher CO2 concentrations. At high pH, I've got lower CO2 concentrations. And this was just a, a, a little um, 
uh, diversion that was uh, where well, I was trying to figure out what is the cost of a carbon concentrating mechanism to a cell. And it turns out the cost of a carbon concentrating to a, of a concentrating mechanism to a cell is correlates with pH, such that the costs are much higher at low pH and the total costs are much lower at higher pH. And this plays out into the various strategies that our algae are going to uh, 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 desire to, to, to live in the environment. And I guess ultimately what I'm trying to suggest is that in these lower O2 to CO2 ratios, we potentially got got higher, uh, sorry, lower pH and therefore a higher um, cost to a CCM. And indeed, it's the CCM which is helping these organisms create uh, that um, uh, uh, lower O2, higher CO2 environment. So ultimately, there is a gradient here of oxygen to CO2 ratios in terms of their selection on the algae. Arguably of pH as well. pH is getting decreasing as we go down this scale. And also potentially of nutrient demand. These, these, lower, these organisms down here perhaps have a higher nutrient demand in order to transport and, and maintain compartments akin to an ancient environment. So that's where I, I wanted to get to in terms of the Rubisco story. And I just wanted to show now some more recent work that we've been doing in my lab, trying to think about how this um, selection for different algal groups also is played out in the trace metal chemistry. We've heard a lot about nutrients today, high nutrients, low nutrients. And I'm going to pick apart a little bit more that in, in the oceans, things need a little bit more than just carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. We've heard iron being mentioned today, and I guess I'm I'm going to just open our eyes to the further vistas of the periodic table in terms of the trace metals uh, that uh, that organisms need and make the argument that trace metals, as we know as geochemists, are highly sensitive to redox chemistry. And indeed, it's that redox chemistry which also makes them so useful to life. Now, there's been some fantastic modeling which shows how trace metals have evolved through time, potentially in re relation to oxygen here. Um, it's interesting that, that, that alongside, I'll come back to this a little bit later, alongside those rising oxygen levels are increasing sulfate levels. And then because of the differing solubilities of the range of trace metals and their differing complex stability constants, in terms of really how easy it is for an element, so something like copper, zinc, and cadmium, has a highly deformable uh, uh, electron shell around it, which is very good at being shared uh, alongside sulfur to make covalent bonds. And that gives these sulfides very low solubilities when we're going up to copper, zinc, and cadmium. As we go towards this end of the trace metals, there the ions are far harder and they tend to form these more electrostatic pairs. So what that means is that copper, zinc, and cadmium form very strong bonds in, with sulfur. And that plays out in the solubility of sulfides, um, whereby they've got, they've got um, very low solubility sulfides. If we can oxidize that sulfur, those trace metals will become available. Similarly, sitting in an ocean where there may be complexing molecules around, again, copper, zinc, and, and nickel are highly complex to sulfur ligands. But if we oxidize an ocean and have much more oxidizing ligands, those elements are much more available. So as we've oxidized the planet, we've changed the availability, firstly, because we've changed the solubility of sulfides to release elements through time, and also in terms of the availability by, by oxidizing ligands and releasing those trace metals. And so this gives us a phasing to the trace metals through geological time in response to, whoops, in response to oxygen. So iron, of course, we know has dropped out to vanishingly low levels as we've gone through this oxic transition transition. Uh, cobalt, manganese have also de declined through time. But things like zinc and copper have increased enormously and perhaps were vanishingly low in these, these ancient oceans and have become much more available uh, in the modern oceans. Now, uh, Antonietta Quigg did some fantastic work looking at metal quotas of cells of, uh, a, a few years ago. And we, again, I, I'm afraid my obsession with peering into genomes to tell me what they, see what they can tell me. And what we've actually looked at is taken the proteomes of a whole range of cyanobacteria and here looking at green algae, the, the primary endosymbionts. 
And we've looked to see of what proportion of that proteome is used for proteins binding to different elements, so for zinc, iron, manganese, copper, molybdenum, nickel, for example. And what we see is a sort of transition, let's say, from the cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria use very little zinc, but they use tons of iron. They use a little bit of manganese, lots of copper. And so there are these trends of difference between the cyanobacteria in terms of the, the dedication of their proteome to certain metals, um, whereas the, the green algae seem different. They seem different. They need a lot of zinc. They've reduced their requirement for iron, increased their requirement for manganese, decreased their requirement for copper, increased for molybdenum, decreased for nickel. My point being is that they seem to be living in a more oxidized world. All of these transitions match what we think is associated with a change in uh, uh, the trace metal chemistry that's associated with ox an, uh, an oxygen-driven transition. So it would seem at least in terms of their use of metals, the, the green algae are much more um, uh, reminiscent of a more oxidized ocean compared to those of a, cy of a cyanobacteria. If we then look to the secondary endosymbionts, if you remember our, our Russian dolls of algae, I was kind of expecting to see the same thing again, that perhaps as we go from the primary endosymbionts to the secondary endosymbionts, we'd see a similar change in the, in the pattern of the elements which goes alongside their redox chemistry, but it wasn't the, it wasn't the same at all. It would seem in the secondary endosymbionts, almost uniformly, they have reduced their requirement for every metal in their, in their proteome. They've essentially streamlined their metal requirement. And this is, I, I should highlight, this is all work that was led by a, a postdoc in my lab, Joan Zhang, who's now gone to the Hong Kong uh, University of Cyan uh, Science and Technology. So within the proteome, we see these different requirements. This is looking at the trace metal requirement where it seems to change alongside an oxic driven transition. And in the secondary endosymbionts, they all become much more trace metal lean. And I apologize for this, I spotted that, that, that this had got a bit mangled, but we also see that these different algal lineages have got different metal transport strategies. And this was triggered by some work in our lab where we were growing organisms in a range of different chemistries. And what we were finding was that they actually had different tolerances to toxicity. And this is something that we haven't talked so much about in the symposium, but this idea that some organisms may be poisoned by various chemicals around them. So it's not always driven by productivity, but there could be toxic thresholds to the chemistry for these organisms. And what we found was that the greens were resilient to anything you threw at them. We were throwing horrible amounts of chromium at the green algae and they would just happily continue growing, whereas the reds were very much more susceptible to, to poisoning and the same was true for, for the cyanobacteria. And this made us think, OK, well, can we look in our, our, our proteomes, actually, at the, at the transport uh, strategies for these organisms in, in terms of, of metals? Now, what's interesting is, is, is the cyanobacteria are absolutely exceptional. I'll just draw your eye to these blue bars at the bottom. They throw a whole 3% of their, their proteome at transport compared to much less than 1% for all of these other um, primary and, and secondary endosymbionts. So they're essentially the kind of almost the sponges of the bacterial world. They seem to throw themselves at transporting things out into the cell and transporting transporting things out of the cell. And it, it's sort of, to me, it was kind of interesting that that goes alongside their idea where they have a, 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 a rubisco very adapted to, to low oxygen, high CO2, where they're having to pump loads of CO2 into the cell or at least capture loads of CO2 to help that environment. So the cyanobacteria really are transporting enormously. And, and what that means is that they, they can live in low nutrient environments, but they can also live in high nutrient environments because they can take in lots of nutrients if they're poorly available, but they're also able to expel um, potential toxins from the cell. If we now look at the, so the, the, the primary endosymbionts, these green uh, lineages here compared to the red lineages, 
What's interesting is that they seem to have slightly different metal transport strategies, actually. I shall draw your eye to these ABC transporters. And I don't know if you, if you can see it, but as we go up this uh, 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 diagram towards the secondary endosymbiont, again, the Navy seems to get longer in these, in these bars. So, and indeed, we, we find this is drawn out of a principal component analysis of, of the sequences that these things have got very distinctive transport uh, uh, approaches and the reds seem to have a transport system which where they have more of these ABC transporters, the more general transporter. So it means they're slightly hostage to fortune. They kind of have to deal with what comes into the cell. And our working hypothesis is that, that they therefore have to live in lower trace metal environments. They're more susceptible to toxicity because these general transporters will allow anything in and they don't have such good flushing out systems. So they're much more adapted to trace metal poor environments where they're not going to become poisoned. If we look to, to the um, secondary endosymbionts, these greens, then they seem to have very much more specific transport systems. So they've got higher concentrations of these PATPases. They've got far more specific uh, manganese and zinc transporters compared to the secondary endosymbionts. So what they seem to be doing is, is selecting what comes into the cell, but it also means that they can select what goes out of the cell. And so they're far more able to live in much higher trade metal potentially um, environments and much higher nutrient environments. Now, if we go a little bit further with this analysis, I, I've tried to tell you that I think that the secondary endosymbionts are better adapted to low trace metal environments. And what's interesting is that if we look particularly at iron, and we look at the iron binding proteins in the proteome. This is looking at the percent of those versus the number of iron transporters. And here we're looking at zinc binding proteins in the proteome and the number of zinc transporters. What we generally see is as we go from old to young, as you need more zinc, you indeed transport more zinc. So that's sort of the logical thing that you would do. What's particularly interesting from iron is as you go from old to young, these are the cyanobacteria going up to the secondary endosymbionts, it's clear they've increased the number of iron uh, 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 transporters at the same time as they've had to decrease the amount of iron binding proteins in the proteome. So this is a real signal that they're having to work hard to get at any iron into the proteome. They're having to diminish the amount of iron binding proteins at the same time as increasing the energy they dedicate to the transport of iron. So it's very clear if we were to see a transition from a primary endosymbiont to a secondary endosymbiont, we're really seeing a change in the iron availability uh, uh, in the environment. What's, what's even more interesting about this affinity of, of these secondary endosymbionts, and I kind of like the symmetry of this, where the, the geology uh, sulfur has really been controlling the trace metals. This is just, again, looking at these, the binding preferences of, of, of different um, uh, ligands for, for metals, where sulfur is incredibly good at binding to copper and zinc. So geology initially had a hold of, of copper and zinc in insoluble sulfides. But what's interesting is if we just look at the percent of cysteine and methionine now, these are the sulfur-containing amino acids, in the transporters from these different algal groups going from the cyanobacteria through to the secondary endosymbionts, they all increase, or they, sorry, the secondary endosymbionts have got increased sulfur binding um, in each of their zinc transporters, their ferric reductase and their, their iron-3 reductases. So they're using that sulfur to give them a higher affinity still to get hold of, of, of those, those key trace metals. So they're working hard to get hold of, of trace metals. So what's the unifying feature that can explain why we, we haven't changed the environment in an oxidizing way? And, and, and my working hypothesis is that at the moment is that when we see a transition from a primary to a secondary endosymbiotic algae, we may indeed be seeing a change in pH. And so this is again coming back to that idea of what environmental parameters are selecting for different algae. Increasing pH has the uniform effect of making trace metals adsorb to iron oxyhydroxides or increasing the adsorption of those onto iron particulates in the ocean. 
So my theory is that that an increase in pH at these these uh, algal transitions is essentially adsorbing every trace metal onto iron oxyhydroxide surfaces and making the the surface ocean trace metal poor. So we've we've seen this this diagram before, and I get I guess I just want to to sort of draw your eye. We we can argue about where this transition from cyanobacteria to to green algae is. In terms of our hypothesis of trace metal transport, we were we were curious that part of this transition occurs after the Sturtian glaciation, and we know the green algae are very good at dealing in high nutrients and high trace metal availability, and perhaps there was a great flush of nutrients into the ocean at this time that helped the green algae flourish. Um, we also think there could be changing oxygen levels at this time. But I guess I want to draw your eye, and Andy highlighted this Mesozoic uh, marine revolution where we go for transition from the green to the red algae. And I guess I just want to say, I think this is an intriguing geological time. And I would argue that we really do change the conditions in the surface ocean in terms of oxygen, pH, and particularly in terms of, of trace metal and, and, and nutrient availability. And that's just to, I think there is less debate about the biomarkers at this time, but we also have the fossil record to actually confirm that this is when the, the, these mineralizing species really take over. And just a, a homage to Andy's fantastic uh, uh, highlighting of this particular transition. We've got more evidence of what's changing as well at this time, this resiliently oxygenated upper ocean, whereby the, 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 the oxygen minimum zones are starting to deepen, we think, at this time. It's potentially related to increased ballast, where we know the export of organic carbon is related to, to mineral uh, minerals in that phytoplankton community and in, in the surface ocean. But we really probably need to have a debate about positive feedbacks again at this time. Is it, is it the change to mineralizing algae that changes the surface water structure that then helps select for mineralizing algae? Or is there some environmental trigger that, that allows those mineralizing algae to start to mineralize? But I suspect that there is a, a, a massive positive feedback where we have a deepened oxygen minimum zone, a selection for the red lineage algae. That leads to lower open ocean nutrients, a raised open ocean pH, decreased trace metals. Um, perhaps this enhanced open ocean pH can also help the calcification and a deeper OMZ. But really, what is it that triggers this positive feedback loop? And just to show we were trying to rationalize where these geological histories of adaptation kept within the algae, does it play out actually in the modern ocean? And, and we looked into this OBIS uh, data set. Thank you, everybody who's dedicated to building huge data sets. And we indeed find that in the modern ocean, at least, the cyanobacteria that we find in the OBIS uh, uh, data set tend to be marginalized to sort of higher uh, nutrient, lower oxygen um, environments, the primary endosymbionts similarly and it's really the secondary endosymbionts that we see being able to thrive out in the open ocean where the, the nutrients are very low, the trace metals are very low, and perhaps the, 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 the pH is higher. And so this sort of, again, it's this, this space and time. It's almost like geological history has imposed the different physiologies on the algae, and they've then had to, to find margins where they can persist and adapt to the changing open ocean conditions. And we happen to be in that oxic world that that selects for the red algae. I'll show you my inter interim conclusions. And if I have a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll just show you a couple of extra slides. But um, my point being is that Rubisco has adapted at times of change in intracellular oxygen to CO2. But that's perhaps in relation to changes in the exterior oxygen to CO2 ratio. And I've tried to show you that there's a scale, at least in physiological adaptation of these different groups of algae, to oxygen, to pH, to nutrients, and potentially to trace metals. And I think that we, we, we therefore can almost turn on, our, on the head how we can look at phytoplankton succession. Because if we can understand these physiological changes, we can actually start to use that succession to tell us about the environmental changes at those transitions.
And so just an indulgence, this is only two slides because I, I, I know you probably all want a coffee at this stage in the afternoon, but just to show some ongoing work where we've really been trying to look, you've, you've heard about affinities for trace metals. We're now trying to look at the physio physiological affinities of cyanobacteria. We've got this high iron requirement. Coccolithophores is a terribly low iron requirement. And we've been trying to map out how these different elements um, play out in the phytoplankton of, of, of the modern ocean and select for different phytoplankton groups. And again, this is just some work that Joan has, has been doing, showing the growth of cyanobacteria. Now we have global scale trace metal data sets. We can actually start to use those trace metals to see where the selectivity is between these different phytoplankton functional groups, between the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, the coccolithophores, and the cyanobacteria, and start to chart out where each of these groups are limited by the different metals dependent on their affinity for those metals. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>